My name is Jackson Nickerson, and I'm the Associate Dean and Director of Brookings Executive Education. I welcome you to today's conversation on Tackling Wicked Government Problems, a Practical Guide for Enterprise Leaders. Our conversation today is based on a just-released book by Brookings Press. I have a little copy here. Some of you have one. Uh, also for sale afterwards in the bookstore. It's under the same title. It's co-edited by Ron Sanders to my left and myself. Uh, the book has a connection to history that I think you might find interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you. Four and a half years ago, uh, the Brookings Institution partnered with the Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis to manage Brookings Executive Education. The idea then, as uh, it is now, was to combine cutting edge leadership thinking from one of the world's top business schools with the policy and government expertise of one of the world's uh, leading think tank, if not the world's leading think tank, to create a new model <laughs> for leadership development. My hope is that you are as pleased with the innovative results as, as I am. Now you might wonder why the Brookings Institution would collaborate with Washington University in St. Louis. Well, a look back into the history might explain the choice. Both institutions had a common benefactor, Robert S. Brookings. He was president of the Board of Trustees at Washington University for 27 years. And in 1916, he and other reformers founded the Institute of Government Research, which was the first institution to bring science to the study of government. And it was the forerunner of the Brookings Institution. Now, less well known is the fact that at about the same time, in fact, the same year, he approved the founding of the business school at Washington University to bring science to the study of leadership. Uh, now, with a common benefactor founding both institutions during the same era, it somehow seems a fitting that they came together to support and advance Brookings executive education. Uh, Robert S. Brookings was a forward-thinking advocate for uh, effective and efficient government and leadership. He had a deep interest in educating government leaders in the art of handling problems. So when an opportunity presented itself to study and write about how to help public servants engage in the art <coughs> of tackling wicked problems, I left it the chance. The book and today's conversation are based on a conference held almost a year and a half ago, co-sponsored by Booz Allen Hamilton through the leadership of Ron Sanders, and by the Olin Business School through Brookings Executive Education. The idea of the conference was straightforward. How can we understand how the nature of leadership in the federal government is changing? And how can we use leading thinking about networks to develop leaders to handle these challenges? Out of the conference came an understanding that the challenges, the, let's call them problems, facing government have shifted increasingly uh, these problems that the federal government uh, faces are wicked, which uh, to me means that they're complex with many moving parts, they're ill-structured, meaning we haven't seen them exactly before, and that typically they span multiple agencies, multiple departments, even uh, NGOs, and even other governments. The question then is, how can federal leaders with narrowly defined authorities tackle these wicked problems? Perhaps more importantly is how can we increase the supply of federal leaders who can tackle these problems? We discovered that presently the federal government does not systematically develop individuals who have the capabilities to lead across the enterprise. Now, this book draws upon practitioners and professors to clearly formulate the challenge of developing enterprise leaders, as well as offers feasible and we think implementable solutions to greatly increase the supply of enterprise leaders. But today, you'll have the opportunity to engage with enterprise leaders and frontline practitioners. My hope is that they will share their stories, not only about the challenges of wicked problems that they faced, uh, but also how enterprise leaders can successfully tackle them. Also, they will discuss what the federal government can do to systematically develop enterprise leaders. Now, to begin the conversation, I'd like to introduce you to Ron Sanders, who I'll hold, hand the podium over to. Ron is the vice president, or a vice president, with Booz Allen Hamilton, and its first fellow. He joined the firm after a 37-year distinguished career in federal service. He served the intelligence communities, or as the intelligence community's chief human capital officer. 
He was in the Office of Personnel Management as the Associate Director of Policy. He was with the Internal Revenue Service as the Chief Human Resource Officer. And he was the DOD's Director of Civilian Personnel. I think he's seen some of these wicked problems and understands a little bit about the challenges of developing enterprise leaders. Please join me in welcoming Ron Sanders. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to stand down in front and pace a bit. I like to present a moving target. Uh, that's one of my strategies for tackling wicked problems. I'm going to be joined in a second by my colleague, Thad Allen. And as you heard, we're both formers. Thad needs no introduction. Uh, we both spent a lot of time in government, uh, almost a century between us. That really makes us seem old. Uh, tackling uh, this notion of wicked problems that Jackson has set up. So what I'm going to do for a few minutes is set the stage, both for the, what we're talking about in the book and for the morning's event. Um, so the morning's event first, you're going to hear from Thad and I talk about uh, in a little bit more depth this notion of enterprise leadership. As I said, we've lived it and we've tried to capture it uh, in the book because it is, uh, in fact, what we believe to be the new normal for federal leaders. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, after we do that for a little bit, I'm going to introduce Elaine Kmark. Many of you know Elaine. She um, uh, made her name with uh, the Vice President, Vice President Gore, uh, reinventing government um, about a decade and a half ago. And she's back at Brookings, uh, directing uh, something called the Leadership and Management Initiative. And I'm sure she'll talk about that. Uh, and she'll moderate a panel of real live enterprise leaders. And we have four interesting perspectives to share with you this morning on the panel. Uh, first, we have Steve Shi, who's uh, Deputy Associate Director of OPM. And among other things, what Steve does is run the entire federal SES. So he's in charge of policy. Yeah, uh, if you want to talk about rank awards, Steve's the guy. Uh, no, just kidding. This is about enterprise leadership this morning. And Steve has been a champion of that. And he really is uh, in the pilot seat when it comes to moving the SES forward. Uh, secondly, we have Laura Craig. Laura will be joining us here in a second. Uh, Laura um, comes to us from the Government Accountability Office, where she spent the last couple of years of her life studying the challenges of interagency collaboration, and as a uh, dimension of that, how to prepare leaders to do that, essentially on point with the book. And she'll share the results of those uh, reviews and audits and reports with us, again, as a way of charting um, a path forward. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Jim Trinka, who uh, is, as I said, uh, himself an enterprise leader. So too is Steve. Steve's got a, um, the, a, an unusual pattern for um, SESers. He's actually moved between agencies, um, as have I, as has Jim, and we'll, I'll talk in a minute about Susan Kelly here. Um, uh, that's a very small minority of the SES core, unfortunately. Uh, Jim Trinka uh, worked for me at IRS, uh, FBI, FAA, and now he's at VA. He actually runs an, uh, one of the first programs to develop the SES Corps as an interagency, government-wide resource, sort of back to the future. And Jim will talk about some of the challenges of running that program and some of its content because it's relevant to today's subject. And then last but not least, um, uh, an enterprise leader from the front lines, Dr. Susan Kelly, who comes to us from DOD, where, um, among other things, she is currently the department's representative on the White House Task Force on Veterans Employment, one of those classic interagency task forces that we're going to talk about. Um, lots of activity, uh, and hopefully in this case some results. And she's going to share um, her experiences there in doing other interagency things. Uh, but there's been a recent development that I know Susan's going to talk about with that task force, and some of you will recognize how difficult it will have been to reach the milestone she's uh, going to talk about. So that'll be the morning, and then Jackson will, will, uh, will conclude. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions and interaction. So does that sound about right? All right, speak now, forever, hold, forever hold your peace, because we're ready. All right, so we talked about the new normal. Jackson's already set the stage a bit. Uh, this notion of wicked problems, as we have defined them, have a couple of common denominators that I want to underscore. First, they are all inter in nature. Interagency, international, intersectoral, intergovernmental, put the word inter and fill in the blank. What we've discovered is that all of the big challenges facing our government, and frankly, all of the big challenges facing our nation, are inter in nature. No more can you fit them into nice, neat bureaucratic stovepipes. Homeland Security does this, HHS does that, HUD does this. 
Here's a problem fitted in the box and it's solved. Uh, the problems we face in this vertically structured government cut a horizontal swath across that government. Uh, the, the Partnership for Public Service in Booz Allen just released a report last week emphasizing that and talking about a number of strategies to rebuild the federal enterprise. That's what we're talking about, an enterprise approach to government and in this case to leadership. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in, in a little bit about what enterprise means, both from a structural standpoint as well as from a leadership standpoint. But that common denominator, it's cross-cutting and boundary spanning. And underneath that, some of you have experienced this firsthand. I know, I know Susan and Steve have. No one is in charge, or maybe everybody is in charge. Uh, everybody reports to a different uh, agency head or cabinet secretary. There's no common chain of command. Okay, as a practical matter, we all report to the president. But um, you know that you can't go running to the president every time two agencies can't agree, because that's all the president would end up uh, doing. Uh, so you've got all of these, co these chains of command at vertical stovepipes all trying to collaborate towards some common inter-fill-in-the-blank end. It requires a new set of leadership competencies. And it's frankly a set of competencies, again, Thad and I will talk about that, that most of us weren't prepared for. I'll speak for myself and my early interagency experiences in defense, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and our fourth branch, uh, the Marine Corps, um, and Susan and I were kidding uh, ourselves. I, I used to um, adopt the habit of wearing purple every time I had one of those sessions because in DOD, purple means joint. It means inter-service. But it's, three, it's been three decades in the making and still a work in progress. Um, but we are typically developed as leaders with an implicitly inward bias. We run an organization. There's a boss. There are subordinates. There are peers. And we have to get along with them, but as I said, ultimately there's a chain of command you can run to your boss to be arbiter. Uh, there's an external environment. All our leadership development programs talk about that. Uh, and we learn as leaders to be aware of that external environment and to navigate it. But under those models, there's a we and a they. And in enterprise, there's no we and a they, there's an us. And we have to learn to do things like lead without formal authority, where almost everything we do as leaders implicitly or explicitly goes back to our job. So we're going to talk about those leadership competencies um, as we go through the morning. But those are the kinds of competencies that Jackson and I and uh, the contributors in the book uh, talk about. How do we prepare the government for the new normal, for this notion of enterprise and this challenge of enterprise leadership? So with that, uh, Thad, talk about help wanted. <laughs> Good morning. What we're looking for are leaders that understand, can operate in, and manage complexity. Uh, complexity that goes well beyond uh, the authorities, the jurisdictions, the appropriations, the regulations, the policies, and even the culture of uh, the organizations that they're uh, working in. Uh, because when you're looking at these very complex problems, it is well beyond the purview of any particular agency uh, to solve by themselves. It puts a premium on a collaboration, networking, cooperation as the only way to succeed moving forward. And Ron is right. The president can adjudicate every disagreement or overlap of jurisdiction. Uh, I was talking with the president during the Deepwater Rise and Oil Spill, and he wryly stated, then he stated later on in a press conference, that he never realized that when a salmon was in fresh water, it was owned by Interior. When it got to salt water, it was owned by Commerce. I'm not sure the salmon knew but you try and direct their behavior. So when we talk about enterprise leadership, what we're really talking about is managing very complex programs that have to be co-produced. And I steal that term from Don Kettle, who's a professor of public policy at the University of Maryland, and that includes uh, the private sector as well. And we need to learn how to understand the inner workings and how we do this together to accomplish the, uh, the ends that we're trying to do in public service. So let me just take uh, <clears throat> one quick example in chaos. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Katrina first, and I'll talk about the oil spill later. Uh, trying to understand what's going on in chaos and trying to figure out what the problem really is is important. You've got to kind of unchain your thinking. For the first week following the landfall of Hurricane Katrina, we thought we were dealing with a hurricane. There was an emergency disaster declaration. State and local governments were in charge. All powers not granted the federal government are reserved to the states. 
Uh, I was sent down by uh, President Bush a, a week after the storm came ashore, after the Superdome and the Convention Center meltdowns. As I flew in the, in the city on the uh, 6th of September, I looked over and I said, my God, we got the problem wrong. If you don't get the problem statement right, you're not going to get the solution right. We weren't dealing with a hurricane anymore. After the hurricane passed and the city was flooded, we were dealing with what was the equivalent of a weapon of mass effect used on a city without criminality, the result in the loss of continuity of government. Now that's a big, long sentence. What they didn't need was a bunch of resources flowing into the city. They needed to reconstitute the elements of civil society that would allow local leaders to carry out their authorities and their jurisdictional responsibilities, which, working with General Ross Honore and I, we put together an organization that was able to do that. But the key there was trying to understand the problem, look through the chaos and the complexity, and then focus on what you really need to do to solve that. In the oil spill, the overlapping jurisdictions were extraordinary. I just mentioned wildlife. Uh, you couldn't deal with food, and, uh, food safety without talking to FDA and NOAA. You couldn't deal with environmental monitoring without talking about NOAA and EPA. Then you had the state and local governments who were involved as well. The only way we were able to navigate that MELU, I actually established an interagency solutions group. That's what I called it. And I put everybody in the room and I shut pizzas under the door. And I said, unless you want your principals in the situation room talking to the president, let's solve this. And it got to be such a compelling forum to deal with those issues uh, that people started showing up and it actually became a community of interest. And to give you a good example, we were dealing with exposure uh, to volatile organic compounds by workers in and around the oil rig and on shore that we thought the uh, standards for personal protective equipment needed to be lowered so we get personal protective equipment out sooner at a lower threshold. Uh, I wasn't the OSHA administrator, so I went to the Secretary of Labor we signed an MOU that said OSHA and the National Incident Commander would work together, and I merely issued an order. I had no legal authority, but they obeyed it, dealing with complexity. Ron? And that's one of the competencies, I'll put that in quotes, that enterprise leaders need to learn, that there is white space, there are seams, and there are gaps. What Thad did was not illegal, but there wasn't a book that said, when, in, when you uh, confront this situation, here are the three things you do. And, and Ron, I might add, uh, addressing the second bullet, we've got a tremendous effort going on inside this country right now to implement the President's executive order on cybersecurity and infrastructure protection. In the absence of legislation that would actually empower people to do things under law, because we haven't got that legislation yet. So you have NIST that's trying to develop a national set of voluntary frameworks that industry could abide by in dealing with uh, cyber attacks in their specific uh, sectors and then exchange that information with the government, working with Homeland Security, extraordinarily complex. So uh, as we go through these examples, let me uh, paint a contrast for you. Uh, and I'll use the word relative, and I'll underscore that word, because in a crisis like a Katrina or Deepwater Horizon, as difficult as it is to achieve unity of effort amongst all of those agencies, and you need uh, leaders who, like Thad, can speak the language of many of those bureaucracies and then bring them together, there is still the crisis. That's a mobilizing event. It gets people focused. There are people hurting, in some cases dying. Um, but what we're talking about transcends the crisis. There are also enduring endemic challenges like the ones we talked about here. Thad uh, just talked about um, cybersecurity. Uh, if there ever was an interagency, intergovernmental, cross-sectoral, international challenge, it's that. And frankly, one of the reasons we don't have legislation is because all the stakeholders, uh, A, don't even define the problem the same way, much less B, figure, uh, have a common solution to it. So how do we protect our nation's critical infrastructure, the networks and systems that we now take for granted? Um, and uh, NIST, for example, is sort of David and Goliaths. Uh, NIST is in charge of this, DHS is their, um, is, uh, is their compatriot in the effort, but NIST is a relatively small agency trying to herd a bunch of seven, eight, and 900 pound gorillas like DHS and DOD and uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other things. Uh, we'll talk, uh, Susan will talk about the, the third uh, bullet, um, the classic interagency task force. Who here has been on an interagency task force? They are models of efficiency and effectiveness, correct? <laughs> it's how the government gets things done. Um, 
in fact, that is sort of a common MO, and we have to figure out, and Susan uh, Kelly will give us some examples later, of an interagency task force that's actually begun to get things done. Uh, I know that's a contradiction in terms, but we'll talk about that. Th uh, Thad, um, other examples of this new help wanted, the new kind of leader that, uh, that we're looking for? Well, Ron and I have actually worked with uh, the Kennedy School of Government and the School of Public Health up at Harvard. I'm across uh, models here just a little bit on a concept called meta leadership. And meta le leadership involves how do you deal simultaneously with leading up from career to political leaders? How do you still inspire the people that are working for you? How do you cross cut across all those boundaries? And how do you understand that event or the problem that I talked about earlier when I flew into Katrina? But at the center of all of that is the leader themselves and trying to understand who you are as a person, uh, your emotional intelligence, or your capacity for empathy, because not everybody's going to agree, but they need to be heard and they need to understand that you're listening and you're trying to understand where they're coming from. Uh, that puts an extraordinary demand on the personal skills we're developing, and we don't always think about that in classical leadership programs. Most specifically, the one I would tell you about is uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, before we move on, let me just uh, touch on this very last bullet because it's fresh on my mind. I spent the day yesterday with the uh, Federal Interagency Health Care Roundtable, 24 agencies, all involving some facet of our nation's health care system, VA, DOD, because DOD uh, runs one of the largest health care systems, OPM was there because of FEHB, uh, obviously HHS and NIH and the Public Health Service. 24 agencies, and here's their big, hairy, audacious goal to move the nation from health care, that is a focus on preventing or of diagnosing and treating symptoms, to health. Uh, prevention through healthy lifestyle and other choices, which we know will save trillions of dollars in health care costs, but is not part of our um, psychic makeup. And I have to tell you, with all due respect to our my, my colleagues yesterday, and I stood up and told them this uh, yesterday as well. Um, they, are, they are great at admiring the problem. <laughs> um, but think about the challenge of literally changing our nation's culture and trying to mobilize 24 agencies, small, medium, and large, uh, in a dozen different cabinet departments, um, all mo mobilizing them all towards that end. Uh, there again, every agency defined the problem differently. And then in, in that, in that re regard, defines the solution within that same lens. And there are a couple of us, and I'll, I'll single out uh, John Woodson, uh, Dr. John Woodson, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, who gets this, and who's had me come a couple of times and talk to this group about enterprise leadership. And we're actually now beginning to develop strategies to develop leaders on the theory that when you have the leaders in place who understand this, you may actually make some progress. So, uh, some quick definitions and then, um, and then we'll move on. You may have already gotten the drift of this. Uh, again, I apologize for the eye charts, a little dim and that's a little small. Um, but if you're interested in copies of the slides, we'll make sure that, uh, that we can get them out to you. Uh, enterprise and enterprise leadership. Let me define enterprise and then I'll let Thad define enterprise uh, leadership. And again, it ought to be straightforward by now. An enterprise, as we're defining it, is uh, uh, the situation when it takes two or more agencies uh, or levels of government or you name it, stakeholders, but our focus here is on federal leaders because of their role in this enterprise, when two or more of those organizations have to collaborate and integrate and coordinate to get things done that they can't do by themselves. Sounds pretty easy, right? Easy to grasp and it is, as I suggest, the new normal. But one of the threshold hurdles to this enterprise perspective is the notion that we can't do it alone. Because many agencies, again, define the problem in the context of their own programs and their own legal jurisdictions and their own authorities. And um, don't worry about everything outside those boundaries, even though if you look at things like uh, the Government Accountability Office's annual list of duplicative programs, there are 47 agencies involved in food safety, for example. Um, think about that enterprise as a leadership challenge. Uh, so, bad definitions? Well, in my mind, based on the uh, 
major crises I've had to deal with in my life, also trying to uh, make some substantial changes in organizations that I've led. At the core of everything is what I call unity of effort. Okay, now I'm gonna compare and contrast that to unity of command, which is a Title X DOD notion uh, that extends all the way to the president. When you go to boot camp or officer candidate school or whatever, first thing you have to remember is your chain of command all the way to the president, and that is legal authority. In fact, failure to follow the chain of command is actually subjects you to civil, I mean, uh, criminal sanctions potentially. When you move outside of Title X, or you're acting under a law enforcement authority, the best you're going to achieve is unity of effort. That doesn't allow you to compel people to cooperate unless they want to. And to do that, you have to create a set of shared values and a focus on the problem that transcends everything else. And while there's a lot of things that go on out there, whether it's the social media, uh, the press, uh, the political environment, all that other kind of stuff, you really have to kind of focus on the problem you're dealing with and make that the number one goal. I used to tell people that were coming into Coast Guard headquarters that had never been there before, especially coming into senior officers, I said, you have to learn how to be effective in a political environment without being political. By that I mean partisan, frankly. And so what you gotta do is you gotta, you gotta focus on what it is you're going to do, deal with the other things, but you gotta have a North Star. And the North Star is unity of effort related to the task at hand. If you can get everybody subscribed to that based on a set of shared values and the trust that comes with that, uh, you're gonna be successful. So that's enterprise leadership in a nutshell. Uh, but there are some competencies involved. And again, I apologize for the eye chart, but you'll, if you can make it out, we've got two org charts, the classic organizational chart of a bureaucracy, lines and boxes, chain of command, connected by social networks. And that's one of the essential competencies that Thad and I will talk about. But Thad, what are the four things that we think enterprise leaders need to learn how to do to be successful? Well, the first bullet up there is systems thinking. Actually, we kind of stole that from a guy named Peter Senge, wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline, works up at MIT. It's this notion of being able to step back and look at the broader network of issues that are going on or their interacting forces and trying to consider it almost if you were able to pull yourself out of the environment and look down on it. Uh, it takes the ability, again, as I said earlier, to kind of unpack all the baggage you've got, focus on the issue, and then in a very, very straightforward way, try and understand the systems, the dynamics, understand there'll be latency and things that you can't predict, but to the best of your ability uh, to model that. And it takes a development over a lifetime to start approaching your profession as a craft where you try to become a master of that craft in thinking about these problems and how you deal with them. You know, in the intelligence community, we call that connecting the dots. Uh, when we teach this, have you ever seen those um, uh, optical illusions, um, the, you know, the colored dots that make no sense, and if you look at it in a certain way, all of a sudden a 3D picture emerges? I have to tell you, it took me a long time to figure out how to sort of step back, get up on the balcony, and see the patterns. Uh, and it's, you know, that's a little trick, and frankly, some people can't do it, but when it happens, it's remarkable. It's, aha, there's that three-dimensional picture embedded in all of that color. Uh, but think about that as a leadership competency with the dots being agencies and organizations and stakeholders and problems, to be able to see those patterns and connect the dots. And if you don't have an institutionalized way to do this, if there's not a task force that's been chartered by the president, Sometimes you have to create it. Uh, one of the big epiphanies that I had during the oil spill response, and it, it came as a result of a personal conversation I had with the president, was that we should have taken control of the airspace over the Gulf the first day. Uh, we didn't think it was an air event, but we had eight near mid-air collisions. Until the 12th of June, I was coming back with the president on Air Force One after he'd been in Pensacola, and he was gonna address the nation that night. And I looked at him, I said, Mr. President, uh, I'm gonna go talk to the chairman of the joint staff similar to what we did in Haiti to facilitate the landings and relief down there, we need to take control of the airspace. We did improve safety, improved effectiveness, efficiency. We had to create an entity that didn't exist before, but there was a predecessor idea, and that's what we did at Port-au-Prince uh, to control the landing uh, slots that we had there. So what we did was we put everything in uh, Tyndall Air Force Base in Northern Florida where we actually do the Defense of North America uh, Command Center. And I went in there a couple weeks later and we had Air Force officers, Coast Guard officers. We had people from the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
We had computer experts in wheelchairs with ponytails. One well, reason I bring it up, Ron was talking about purple. My, my ponytail, is that what joint? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what we created was plaid. Oh, that's good. We were trying to figure out what you call interagency outside of DOD, plaid. Uh, so we'll all start wearing, we'll start wearing plaid. Uh, uh, look, this is something we can't overstate. Jackson alluded to this too. This is almost a net centric way of looking at leadership because many of the time, many times the dots you're connecting are people. And to be able to connect across agency lines to build those networks and then to leverage them for leadership purposes, that's the fancy diagram we've drawn here, it is both art and science, but it is an essential leadership characteristic. And think about that for a minute. Think about who you could call in another agency, pick up the phone and say, I need you to do something for me, and they'll, they will. Those things don't happen with cold calls. There's also an interesting phenomenon that Jackson and I have been uh, exploring called transitive trust. Uh, I know Susan. Susan trusts me. Uh, I need Steve to do something. Susan knows Steve. Steve knows Susan. Susan knows Ron, Ron knows Susan, Susan trusts Ron, Steve know, doesn't know Ron from Adam, I ask Susan, can, can you get Steve to help me? And they, there's enough trust between the three of us that Steve helps me even though he doesn't know me. Think how powerful that is though, in, not just in a disaster situation, but in trying to deal with some of the enduring uh, problems. Talk about collaboration. You have to be able to get in a room with people that may not have your background, your professional expertise, or the life uh, experience that you've had, and find a way uh, to work together. Uh, the term that I use when I was talking with my staff, I kind of mix metaphors. I call it cognitive diversity. If you agree on a problem, and everybody says, yeah, that's a problem we want to solve it, then the more varied opinions backgrounds and experiences you can bring to bear on that solution increases the robustness and the fidelity of what you're trying to do. When everybody understands that, then there's room for everybody at the table uh, and you can be empathetic and listening to the people and how you want to try and solve the problem. But this notion of listening, trusting, building a set of values is very important. And then finally, if you're a leader, sometimes you're going to have to step right up and say, I'm in charge, it's my responsibility. I'm going to have to assert some authority and until somebody says I can't, I need to push this forward. I, were talking, I was talking to two people <clears throat> that are leading an interagency task force right now on a very, very complicated problem. And they were wondering whether or not they ought to be more forceful in what they're doing. And I was trying to actually tell them you need to be more forceful. So at one point, to make my point, I said, you know what? You just got to declare yourselves the Blues Brothers. You're on a mission from God. <laughs> You're going to save the orphanage and the nuns. Get the mindset and go forward. <laughs> so um, bureaucratic multiculturalism, to be able to speak several bureaucratic languages. Pat Tamburino in the book, Pat works for the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, and Susan's a colleague of his, talks about the first um, early meetings of the White House Task Force on Veterans Employment where they didn't even speak the same bureaucratic language. I have to tell you, when I came to the intelligence community, there was all of this controversy about TSP. I'd come from OPM. TSP was Thrift Savings Plan. What's the big deal? <laughs> Terrorist Surveillance Program. That's the big deal. Um, so if you didn't know that, um, uh, let's, uh, let me uh, uh, segue into um, a quick discussion about how you begin to develop enterprise leaders um, with a focus on this notion of enterprise acuity. That's a couple of $20 words that basically mean you understand the histories, the cultures, the traditions, the mindsets of the agencies you're dealing with sort of this bureaucratic multiculturalism, uh, but on steroids, because frankly, that's not something you can read out of a book. And it requires all of the competencies that we've talked about, building those networks of relationships, connecting the dots in a systematic, systemic way, but understanding all of the actors in the enterprise, what motivates them, what makes them tick, how can you unify their efforts. Um, we have tried to develop enterprise leaders in a couple of um, uh, fairly well-documented now instances. But as I indicated at the um, outset, um, that's, not the, that's not the focus of most agency leadership development programs. Jackson and I spent a lot of time in the book talking about how you can sort of elevate those programs so that you can begin to help 
uh, executives and executive candidates um, become aware at least of the enterprise and begin to demonstrate some of the competencies we've talked about. We've made um, a couple of references to joint, joint duty in the military, uh, born out of uh, an, something called Go Water Nichols. Today in the military, and we have some in the audience, you can't be a flag officer unless you served in a joint operation, a joint command, another part of the, of the department. Again, to build the relationships, to understand the actors, to acquire that enterprise acuity, not just awareness, but acuity. The intelligence community did this, and uh, I wrote a chapter in the book about this. I can't tell you how painful and difficult it was, even in the post-9-11 era, of getting 17 intelligence agencies that report to six different cabinet secretaries, uh, all to say, beyond the principle of our leaders should think enterprise, everybody agrees to that, the mechanics of it are much more problematic because, frankly, agencies think that executives are their property uh, as opposed to a corporate resource, and I know Steve will touch on this in the panel. This is sort of back to the future for the SES because that was the original vision, right? A corporate resource, um, it's certainly not the case today, but I, again, we'll argue that in the new normal they, uh, they need to be. Um, let me just uh, say one word about, again, you can't read this very well, but the National Defense Authorization Act of FY13. Senator Lieberman, before he retired, in his capacity as um, um, chair of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, tried to uh, institute this notion of enterprise, particularly in the national security community, essentially trying to codify something called the National Security Professional Development Program, um, as, as, uh, something uh, President Bush um, issued as an executive order in uh, post-Katrina. The only reason I single that out, because for all of his efforts, uh, the only result in legislation was to do a report on this, uh, which um, I found disappointing. But I want to single out a young man named Gordon Lederman, who was the person on his staff who drove this. Uh, Gordon, unfortunately, passed away a few months ago. We've dedicated the book to him, and I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that he's one of those young people who thought enterprise and um, labored long and hard, even during his illness, to try to make something happen legislatively. And I know he was disappointed that it fell short, but um, I think, uh, I, I hope he, if he's watching, uh, looks at this as a glass half full, because a report can start big things. Uh, Goldwater Nichols started as a report a couple years before it became law. Um, but there have been attempts to begin to do this. Some agencies have. Uh, DOD actually has a, uh, a course that uh, tries to develop enterprise awareness. In this case, it's the defense enterprise. They even have a, uh, their own sixth executive core qualification around leading the defense enterprise. And I won't set Steve Shee up, but I have long been an advocate of that sixth ECQ for all SESers, because until it becomes something like that, it's going to be hard to refocus agency leadership development programs to not just focus on agencies, but to focus on the enterprise. But this is ultimately a leadership development pipeline problem, and I hope we'll touch on that as we go through the morning. So, uh, Thad, any uh, closing remarks to put this um, all in perspective uh, from the front lines? Yeah, I'd like, to, <clears throat> I'd like to start with two concepts, and I'm going to kind of play them out for you in a scenario if I could. Um, great leaders are great learners. Uh, if you want to be a great leader, be a lifelong learner, because you've got to be insatiably curious and firing those synapses off, because you don't know when you're going to get into a situation where you have to do it in a compressed time frame with incomplete information and try and absorb what's going on and get that system's view. The second thing is my favorite definition of leadership is the ability to reconcile opportunity and competency. You can be the best leader in the world, but if you're never given an opportunity, it's a loss for you, it's a loss for the community, it's a loss for society. On the other hand, you need to recognize when there's a window to act, and you need to be prepared to act. <clears throat> uh, I was called by Secretary Chertoff at 11 in the morning on Labor Day, and he said, would you go down and become the deputy principal federal official in New Orleans and assist Mike Brown? again, following the convention center and the Superdome. I had some misgivings because I wasn't sure all the windows hadn't closed to be able to do anything about it. But my wife reminded me that I, I preached to everybody <laughs> that my favorite definition of leadership is ability to reconcile opportunity and competency, and she kind of said, man up. So, uh, <laughs> ultimate kitchen pass. <laughs> if she would have known it was going to be six months, she probably would have rethought it. 
but uh, when I flew into New Orleans that morning, I knew we had to do something, and I already told you the problem statement. We did that by unifying all the efforts, dividing the city into sectors, touching every house. Remember the spray-painted symbols and everything? And we did that providing, by providing logistics, security, admin, communication support for local officers to do their job. In other words, we breached the gap for the loss of continuity of government. Had we done that a week earlier, I'm not sure we have the problem in the Superdome or the convention center because that's what the city really needed. So here's the postscript. <clears throat> that Friday on the 9th of September, I get a call from Secretary Chertoff. He says, get up to Baton Rouge, I want to talk to you. We had established what's called a joint field office under the Stafford Act in Baton Rouge. It was an old Dillard's warehouse and store complex in Baton Rouge. There were 5,000 people in this place trying to run the entire response for all the agencies and everything else. So I get up there and, and they've got an office for them and they've got brown paper over all the windows so you can't see what's in there. I'm going, oh my God, performance counseling. So, so I walk in, he says, shut the door. Because here's the deal, we're gonna have a news conference in 30 minutes and you're gonna leave a Mike Brown of the entire response in the Gulf. So in case you're wondering what my tasking was, how I found out about it and the details associated with it, that was it. <laughs> uh, I called Mike Brown in, I said, Mike, it's gonna be a news conference in 30 minutes. Dad's relieving you to go back and be the director of FEMA. And he said, I'm not gonna go out there and get vilified by the press. If they come at me, I'm coming up in. And Secretary Chertoff said, you're gonna keep your mouth shut and I'll do all the talking. And I'm looking for a table to dive under. <laughs> okay. So we had what was arguably the most uncomfortable press conference I've ever been involved in. If you don't believe me, go Google Alan Chertoff and Brown and see what comes up in the pictures. <laughs> Brown storms off, Mike Chertoff leaves. My aide looks at me and she goes, so what are you gonna do now? Legitimate question. So thinking back to opportunity and competency and what you need to do, I remember the conversation I had walking into the building that morning. I walked up to this uh, lady and I said, how you doing? She was a FEMA employee and she goes, working 20 hours a day. I'm helping people. I feel really good about it. But I go back to my hotel room at night and I can't turn on the television because I see my agency and my leaders being vilified. And it's killing me because these people are working really hard here. I went, Got some serious issues here. So I looked at my aide and said, I want to have an all hands meeting. And she reminded me there were 5,000 people and this was kind of a conglomerate warehouse store complex. And I said, get as many people as you can in one room, I want to talk to them. So about 30 minutes later, I walked into what used to be the, the bottom floor of a Dillard store. And there were about 2,500 people and they were hanging off the rafters. So I got up on a desk with a loud hailer and I said, listen, I have to go back to New Orleans. They all know what, what had happened already. And I gotta make sure we keep doing what we're doing down there because it's working. I'll be back in 24 hours, here's who you call, whatever. <clears throat> then I looked at them all and I said, I'm giving you an order. All right, I had no moral, moral authority to give an order, but there's an old saying, you don't have sovereignty unless you can exert it, all right? <laughs> I, said, I said, you're to treat everybody that you come in contact with that's been impacted by the storm as if they're a member of your own family your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. I said, I'm telling you this for two reasons. Number one, if you make a mistake, you're gonna err on the side of doing too much. And at this point in this response, I'm okay with that. Number two, if somebody's got a problem with what you did, their problem's not with you, their problem's with me, I told you. They need to deal with me. At that point, people started openly weeping in the room. And there was a collective sigh that changed the barometric pressure in the building. Nobody in very simple terms had told these folks what the real issue was. That one goal without partisanship or anything else you can focus on to the exclusion of everything else that unifies everybody under a set of principles and values from which you can build trust. But more importantly, nobody ever told these people that somebody had their back. This comes up time and time again in public service. Every time there's an issue, the funding's reduced, becomes a referendum on public service. Wrong question, wrong assertion. The question is how do you apply the resources of passion and commitment to the best ends? Now, you're probably asking, and I get this question all the time. Okay, Admiral, you're a four star, you work for the president, you can tell people what to do, everybody says, yeah, I'll do it. I'm a GS-14, I'm a GS-15. And my answer is wrong. You always have the opportunity to reconcile opportunity and competency. You always have the opportunity to make clear, unambiguous statements to your people about what the goal is, the values associated with that. 
And you can always tell your people that you have their back. So if there's the essence of enterprise leadership, it is to unify folks around some huge, big, hairy public policy goal, whether it's a disaster or some other um, national challenge. And while that's difficult, frankly, that's where enterprise leaders get their leverage. You just heard an example of that. Um, orders don't do it. It's getting people mobilized around that larger vision that requires all of them to work together. That's the essence of, of enterprise leadership. So um, with that, um, Elaine, I'm going to ask you to come up with our panel. And as you're transitioning, I took the liberty of, in, of introducing them uh, at, the, uh, at the outset. Um, but if you'd all come on up. Uh, and as we segue, um, this is a list of the folks in the book, and they're both practitioners and academics. I got to say this uh, on behalf of Thad and Mike McConnell, uh, former director of national intelligence. Um, we all work for Booz Allen, and I have to thank Booz Allen for giving us the opportunity and letting us do stuff like this, because it's not billable. It's just for the public good. And uh, there are lots of others that contributed, too, but um, I, I, I wanted to... Uh, say that uh, publicly. So with that, um, Elaine, um, over to you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. While we're getting settled, let me just say this is a, a wonderful book with some pretty incredible stories in it and a pretty incredible wrap up at the end about enterprise leadership. So this is a real addition to the field of leadership in the public sector. And, and I think, uh, thank you very much to Ron and to Jackson. Where's Jackson? Jackson here? Oh, okay. <laughs> for, uh, for doing this, I suspect we will, Brookings will get lots and lots of use out of it in the, in the coming uh, years, as will, of course, the, the government. Um, let me, I uh, you know you introduced the panel before, um, so let me just start right in, because what I want to focus on in the panel are, is sort of what the next step. I mean, can this, in fact, really happen, all right? Can, is there such, can we make enterprise leadership and the, the sort of set of concepts it encompasses, can we make it a reality? And to do that, I'm going to start with Steve Shee. Okay, because frankly, you've, you're in the agency, you've got the assignment, so to speak. Um, and I want to ask you two things. Is it possible to develop this? And secondly, are interagency assignments realistic in this day and age when, when senior executive serv service members are so busy and so overworked? Is, is this realistic? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the question. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it absolutely is not only realistic, but absolutely critical in order to be able to face the uh, current wicked challenges of today and the foreseeable future. Um, I was at DHS and had the honor of working with uh, Admiral Thad Allen. Um, and in a span of about six months between 2009 and 2010, we had a series of consecutive back-to-back -back crises that not only uh, impressed upon us the fact that not uh, a single agency or organization has the control and the authority to be able to tackle all these wicked problems of today, but no single organization has the resources in a budget-constrained environment uh, as of today. So in November 2009, we had the Fort Hood shooting. The following month, December 2009, I'm in my basement uh, playing with my kids on Christmas Day, got a call from the secretary's office at DHS, uh, and it was the under, uh, attempted uh, uh, underwear bomber uh, bombing incident in Detroit, Michigan. The following month, as we're dealing with all of the uh, terrorist activities and the, the screening that went into that underwear bombing incident, we had the Haiti earthquake. Uh, that was January 2010. A couple months later, in April 2010, we had the attempted bombing in Times Square followed by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I remember sitting in a conference call in January of 2010, hearing Admiral Allen identify to uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security uh, that there was a need for an enterprise response. He identified the fact that we needed to be able to control the, the airspace over Haiti in a coordinated manner, and he began laying out the, the seeds of a coordinated collaborated response. And it really resonated with me that there was a perfect example where not only did one department not have the control and the authority over all of the coordinated response that was necessary, but we didn't have the resources either. 
Okay. So to answer your question, it absolutely is critical in order to uh, address these challenges. Uh, is it possible to foster these types of interagency uh, rotations and sort of collaboration? I absolutely think it is. Uh, Dr. Sanders uh, set up the, the answer really by talking about the fact that the Senior Executive Service was created in 1978 as a corporate cadre of executives who are responsible for providing strategic leadership, selected, developed, appointed, managed, and retained because of their ability to provide executive leadership and to be deployed throughout the entire federal government. So the SES is a perfect place to start. It is going to require support and commitment from leadership top down, but I also very much appreciate what Admiral Allen mentioned about opportunity to, to provide influence. And we have opportunities as, as leaders, no matter how large or small our span of control is, to influence others in terms of fostering an enterprise approach. Well, let me just play devil's advocate for a minute. So on the question of interagency rotations, you know, I mean, obviously all of our models is uh, Goldwater Nichols, um, but that was for a common end, which was war fighting. So let me just say, would you put some limitations on it? Would you take SES um, biochemists from FDA and rotate them through Army personnel? Okay, would you, or, or would you bound this in some way? So I, I think your question gets to the point that there is some value in terms of uh, respecting agencies' discretion and, and control over their human resources, including executives. Uh, quite frankly, uh, there are reasons that agencies would want to retain control and not necessarily share their human resources. They spend quite a bit of time and investment in selecting and recruiting the right types of individuals and also focusing on achieving the right fit for leadership culture within their agencies. These are factors in, a, in addition to the fact that there's a need for continuity that transcends sort of projects, task force, initiatives, even administrations uh, that suggest that there's a value attached with having executive resources that stay put uh, and provide the long-term institutional knowledge and the continuity and knowledge transference within an organization. I think the key here ultimately though is if as organizations in the federal government we focus on developing executives to be able to have these enterprise leadership competencies then there's a range of opportunities along a spectrum in terms of how much we actually deploy them throughout the enterprise. Uh, you, can, you can take an approach where uh, following the DOD and the IC approach, there's a value attached to ensuring that individuals, maybe pre-SES or even post-SES appointment, um, have this type of rotational experience and diversity of, of experience and, and, and cognitive thought. Um, and then there's a range on the spectrum in terms of uh, the Partnership for Public Service, for example, in their current uh, enterprise mobility uh, report suggests that you could have a cadre that's uh, uh, staffed with executives who are specifically focused on enterprise leadership and are more mobile, and then you could have another core uh, that would stay in place to provide the long-term continuity. Great. Um, Susan, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I think we all, we're going to keep coming back to the same topic of how do we make this happen. But Susan, um, you actually did this um, at the, with the Veterans Administration and DOD. Thinking about what you did, right, what would you tell Steve about what OPM should be doing to try and make this system wide? I think that while you're developing that SES cadre, that we need to at the same time be thinking of pulling the, those folks who are going to follow in our footsteps with us. So that while you have a, a set of senior leaders who are uh, rolling up their sleeves and, and getting dirty with the problem at hand and showing all of the, and it, well, showing all of the skills that you are talking with because it was very exciting to hear uh, the two of you talking about um, the skills, but also some of the attributes, the personal attributes that senior leaders were showing. And I can, I can give specific examples of how that is happening day in and day out on this task force and how it happened from the beginning. But while you have that, those senior leaders who are driving this change, you also need to be bringing those junior folks with you who are uh, perhaps subject matter experts, but you also have to be pulling them along deliberately and exposing them to the nuts and bolts of this interagency work 
sometimes the not pretty side of it, but to build up their, uh, their awareness as well as their resilience. It takes some real resilience to work on an interagency, on an interagency initiative. So I would, I, would, uh, I would look at the pulling young people along with you so that we're not always just focused at this high level or at those 14s and 15s, but pull pull on, them pulling them along. Yes. The other thing you said that was that made me curious is you said subject matter experts. Yes. So with the the twenty first century federal government is a very expert heavy government. Yes. It is not as it was in the nineteen fifties a government mostly of clerks mm -hmm. who were you know filing things and keeping track of things, and a lot of those experts are in the SES. And yet they're there really because of a scientific expertise, a technical expertise, et cetera. Does it make sense to have experts lumped with managers? I mean, is it time to think about the SES differently? I would say absolutely. I don't think we have the luxury of saying either or. I think it has to be a combination. And it takes a certain level of intelligence, a certain level of drive, and risk taking, the ability to put yourself out there. Uh, but we don't have, I don't think we have the luxuries, partic particularly in our budget uh, situation, <laughs> uh, to say you can only do this, you can only do that. And I also think that as you uh, practice these skills at a certain level, those skills you begin to hone you begin to generalize them at higher and higher levels when you when you become a more uh, strategic uh -huh. fo focused uh, focused outlook. But I think that's one of the competencies that has to be looked at: the ability to balance a strategic view, but also to look at what can really work in practice and at execution level and in the field. So it's uh, that is a competency that that you really have to. Uh, hone, but also be willing to uh, say, I don't know if this will work and pull other folks mm -hmm. together. It's a certain level of humility to a acknowledge you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> Laura, um, you've studied these interagency collaborations and leaderships. Trying to put this into practice more broadly throughout the federal government, what do you think the biggest problem is? You know, I've been thinking about it a lot as I've heard uh, uh -huh. everyone speaking this morning, and this this little thing keeps going through my head. You know how in the the real estate, you know, location, 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 yeah. and I'm thinking <laughs> for interagency collaboration and uh, programming. Really, it's incentives, 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 and I think what our work has really shown us is that. It's not necessarily the, I think some of the incentive structures are very obvious. I mean, I think um, the idea that you can, uh, you can bring, you know, you can put together an interagency rotation program, um, but there's no incentive to participate. I, I think that's been well documented and, you know, mm -hmm. with Goldwater Nichols and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's more complex than that because there are really multiple players involved that you have to think about their incentives. So you don't, e you don't just have the participants, you have, the agency that's receiving, you know, the uh, the uh, interagency rotate or you know wh whatever you want to call it, and although at the very top level of leadership, you know, another agency might say, oh yes, we we really want to support this program. There's the the frontline managers that might be stuck in their mind supervising <laughs> someone. You know, there's there are all sorts of perverse incentives. I think is is really, I think we need to be very strategic in how we think of those. Um, you know, there, there are incentives for the managers who are letting go their best people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to get out there and the per perverse incentives for them not to. So sure. I think it's very complicated and I, I think that how you design it and perhaps even bringing people together to be collaborative in the design that are representing all of the different interests um, and thinking about how you can make it a win-win, I think that's critical um, and I don't know that in the human capital area, we've always been set up to do that. So I think that's, that's sort of an issue. Yeah, I, go ahead. I'd like to add another perspective to that. I don't think that rotational assignments are always the best answer. And I think we have so many opportunities right now to address the problems in a much larger way 
and we and to recognize that even today we need an interagency ac action towards solving those problems. We don't necessarily have to rotate. We mm -hmm. just need to engage all of the agencies together to solve these larger issues. It helps to have a crisis uh, with Katrina and with the oil spill, et cetera. But we have some very huge problems out there now that require interagency um, tackling it doesn't require rotational assignments. It mm -hmm. requires us to change the way we think about the problems and all come to gr together and uh, try to go forward with some joint results, larger picture results. Rotational assignments are one way. Mm -hmm. let, let me, let me yep. just sort of add to that. I, I absolutely agree. I don't think they're the only answer. Um, I think it's a tool, um, again, the idea that you can get multiple benefits out of it, it's a tool for professional development. I think the idea being to inculcate some of those uh, competencies that, that Ron has been talking about and others have been talking about. Um, I, you're right, it's a, it's a high investment strategy, and so I think it has to be used carefully, and I think there are other ways to not only get the sort of things done that you're talking about, but to develop that enterprise perspective that's so important. But I, I, from our work, I think it, it's, it's interesting. You really do see um, some surprising things. I think it's obvious that you, know, you send somebody over to another agency, they learn, you know, they sort of get an, a foundational understanding of, of other agencies, of other resources that they can draw on when they, when they go home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they sort of, um, you know, they learn a lot of things they get the other perspective, but the thing that really struck me interviewing many, many, many people <laughs> is that what they learned the most was what it was like to look back, being outside and looking in at their own agency and getting a sense of, you know, wow, this is how others perceive my, agent, my agency and if I wanna negotiate, if I wanna be a leader that can cut across these, these organizational boundaries, I have a better sense of what's important to others and how we're perceived, mm -hmm. and I think that's a very powerful thing. But I, d I really do agree. Mm -hmm. It is a, a high uh, investment, a big investment, and it's not the only way to do it. Uh, uh, Jim, um, you, you run something called Leading Edge, mm -hmm. um, geared towards government-wide leadership for the SES in, I guess, 14 agencies. Right. Um, Tell us what you do in that program, why it was created in the first place, and how it links to the discussion we've been having this morning. Oh, I'd be happy to, because I'm, I'm sitting here and uh, <laughs> really waiting, wanting, waiting. To, wanting to say something here. And, and you know, you like to, you said you want to be a little bit, uh, take the other side of the issue. And of course, I'm equally as provocative. I'd be equally as provocative, I guess, to say that I don't, I think if you start at the executive level for interagency assignments, it's way too late and it's not going to help. The one thing that the lesson that um, the DOD has learned is that yes, you have to have to have a joint assignment to become a general, but when, when does that happen? Mm -hmm. That happens in early to mid-career. So, uh, I, and, and the, the benefit that people gain from that is networking. And I think that is the biggest thing that, that the Leading Edge program tries to foster across government is to have people know about what each other does. Because, as you said, we, we just don't know. I mean, if there, I, I, I give an example. I know there's all these crises example, but I know they would all say, you know, if we can do it, I've heard that Alan say this too, if we can do this in a crisis, why can't we do this every day? Um, you know, if there's smoke coming out of a smokestack where you say, well, that might, it might be dirty, that's probably EPA's business, right? Uh, and then you think about it and it says, well, it's coming out of a, a power plant. Well, that's probably Department of Energy. Well, it's on federal land. Well, that's probably Department of Interior. It might be a commercial enterprise. Well, that's commerce. I mean, you know, you could go on and on. There's a hospital or there's HHS. I don't know, there's public housing, there's HUD. So, you know, you can go on and on and on here. And people do not um, realize that that people are, there's so many other people's mission is to, to help out in this, in this day-to-day uh, -day issue. And so what we try to do is get people together to find out those kind of things. And I think that's more than anything else what we attempt to do through our program is people to build their networks. And uh, because I think we haven't, we've failed at, at building those networks early on in people's careers. 
and that's what uh, the DOD's program through the Gold War Nichols Act has actually done, is build people's networks. So, you know, I knew, when I was in the military, I knew a lot of people in uh, all the services, just because I w went to different schools and, and all that kind of thing, and it, and it helped out. I, I called on them, and, you know, people are willing to, to cooperate and collaborate to solve a problem in, in, on any forum, they just don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that's the biggest thing, is, is just the knowledge of that whole thing. Well, and a little earlier, Thad Allen talked about the importance of giving permission. Mm -hmm. Permission is really very important. You know, when some of these messes happen, right, um, where do they end up? They end up at the White House. Mm -hmm. And having worked there for five years, I can tell you the White House has very little capacity. I mean, the problem with saying, let the White House do it, or the problem with all these silly czars that every president seems to think are going to solve problems is there's no capacity in the White House. Or to put it another way, they have no planes, no trains, no automobiles, <laughs> no trucks, <laughs> no guns, no nothing. So usually what happens is if you wait for the coordination problem to go to the White House, you're probably by that time in a big, big problem. And in fact, part of I think what you're, I, I think particularly what you were talking about, Susan and James, is, is kind of getting ahead of big, big problems, I mean, by, an, by establishing an interagency leadership culture. Mm -hmm. um, other comments, and then I think we'll take some questions from the floor. And anybody, anybody want to add anything? Yeah. I just want to add real quick, and, and sort of leaping onto your point about incentives, um, I want to get a little bit away from the notion that agencies uh, and executives operate in silos because they're either selfish or, or don't understand the value of court coordination. I, I think one of the keys ultimately is that we have very, very limited resources in every single agency. And executives and organizations are motivated to achieve certain performance goals that are focused on their specific organizations. Uh, and so one of the keys in, in this book, Tackling Wicked Problems, and, and uh, one of the things that the partnership talks about in its report is sort of reframing that focus, to mm -hmm. your point. Um, it's an organizational incentive in addition to an individual incentive. And, and one of the things that uh, enterprise leadership really uh, fosters is a more strategic way of thinking. Um, Dr. Jackson Nickerson talks about a star model of leadership, and one of the first things is stop, and then you think, then you act, right? Uh, and oftentimes, uh, to your point, Elaine, we have a lot of leaders who are very much subject matter experts. We know the what and the how, and that's what we're trained to do, and that's what we focus on. So when there is an issue, whether it's a crisis or whether it's a more endemic issue, we leap into it and we start solving it. What we really need to do is we need to stop for a second and think about it strategically, what is the best way to achieve the desired outcome and why we're doing it. And when we when we stop and think, then we'll realize that we can really accomplish those outcomes through an enterprise approach rather than through a tactical response. Mm -hmm. I remember when Ron came to talk to my, one of my classes at Harvard a couple years ago, and he was in the middle of the Intel um, rotation. And I had just spent the summer in England, guest of the British government, moving f around from MI5 to their defense university, et cetera, talking about these, these Intel issues. And, you know, the simple difference was they all knew each other. <laughs> They all, it was a small government, you know, they all knew each other. So I'd go from one place to the other and they'd say, oh yeah, yeah, you just met with so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and I went to school together or so-and-so and I did this together. And, and uh, so there is a, there's a real problem with bigness, frankly, that, that I think other organizations other than the federal government cope with, but the federal government, let's face it, is very large and, and you can't, this is a really hard thing to do. Um, do we have some questions out there? Anybody? Yes, right here. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, Larry Checo. Um, I think one of the most important things that was said today revolved around trust. And I think that, um, you know, what we don't see a lot in government is trust between these interagencies. So this whole notion of, what, uh, I think it was Ron who was saying, you know, this this networking is, is very important. How do, we, how do we get over that? I heard a lot about the technical expertise, uh, how you have to look at a situation to understand you know, where the leadership comes in. But to me, leadership is all about personal relationships. And if you don't have that, if ego interferes, then you don't have it. I mean, you, you're not gonna solve anything. So how do, how do we you know, promote more of that? Yeah. 
I'll, t I'll take a shot at that just from the experience on the task force. You are e exactly right that trust is at the core of all of it, and that's built on, based upon relationships. And I can tell you, looking back, mm -hmm. hindsight, uh, we had a compelling force. We didn't have a crisis in reference to veterans' employment, but we had a compelling force. Uh, and the agencies that came together shared a concern for veterans who are going to be returning, not only because of goodwill, but also as you looked at it more strategically, of the economic impacts on our communities, of the long-term outcomes when veterans are not uh, integrated, reintegrated back into the communities. So if you looked at a larger, you looked at it on a larger perspective, you were able to hear then more of those voices who were at the table, who were small voices, but when you looked at it on a larger, you, the other voices became uh, included. But as you moved through that, let's recognize that all, every, every agency has an agenda. You, they have their own mission. If you could articulate what was that common value, that common mission that all of the agencies at the table had, sometimes when that trust was even um, injured a little bit, because we're all human, we're all human, and there are egos involved, and we also make mistakes, and sometimes we just step on people's toes without even knowing. Again, you don't know what you don't know. Um, if you recalled, or if somebody had the courage in the day in and day out work of reminding us all what was, what was the core mission here, what was our value, and for num we could all latch on to that value, we could get through some of those, um, those missteps that we made and, and build trust over and over again. But to build that trust, you have got to be sometimes eyeball to eyeball. You have to spend time with people. And I think, as our gentleman said, you have to hear what people have to say. And uh, one of the biggest lessons learned is that when you hear what other people from other agencies do day in and day out, it will blow your mind. You will become even more did you proud. Wanna, did you want to add? Yeah, that? I, I, I did. Uh, in the chapter that, that I wrote, I, I talk about some of the barriers to collaboration. And uh, one of the barriers that I wrote a little bit about was this whole thing I, I called the transaction versus relationship-based collaboration. And I think it speaks to this whole trust issue because I think in this country, we look at collaborating with one another based on a transaction that, that, that can come out of this. So I will cooperate or collaborate with you because it gives me something and vice versa. And whereas in many other cultures uh, other than here, apparently in England as well as you, as you realize that it's based on relationships, certainly Middle East and, and many others, where the relationships is established first and there is trust built and then collaboration follows from that naturally. And uh, I think the more that we can get to that type of a, of a situation with the ty type of networking that happens earlier on in people's careers, perhaps it's a generational thing. Perhaps a, a, another generation that's used to that kind of networking may have less of a problem with this. We'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, but uh, I think that's one of the issues, and it certainly is a, a barrier to collaboration, but certainly not a, uh, not a uh, brick wall. It's, it's certainly easy to overcome. Can I, can I add to that also real sure. quick? Sure. And I think then in addition to trust, which uh, Jim talked about the sort of the value of leading edge, which is bringing together executives to really uh, understand mission, but also to be able to develop those personal networks and relationships to foster that trust. I think the key here is uh, it's, it's shared ownership and it's need. Okay, so we're going to work in multiple organizations and uh, initiatives where we're not necessarily going to trust others. And we're not always going to, it's not always good to trust necessarily uh, everyone. Uh, people come to initiatives with a, 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 their own agendas. Uh, and not to suggest that it's a malicious intent, but it's a different focus. Uh, and so oftentimes what we really need to do is to be able to figure out how to work with people, whether we trust them or not. If Jim and I are in the same boat and we're in a, a storm, and our charge is to save that boat. I'm going to figure out pretty quickly that I can get that boat to shore more quickly uh, and, and more efficiently and safely by having Jim row with me rather than me trying to throw Jim overboard, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I'm going, to, I'm going to work with Jim so that we can jointly row that boat. 
Then once we get the safety, I can throw them overboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we have a question down here. Uh, good morning, Jonathan Fink, OCC. I, I was wondering uh, about the word turf, which hasn't been used yet this morning. Uh, and in, in my area of work, and I think this will be true of many people, uh, it's not only that agencies have different missions, but they are suspicious of each other or nervous of, of motives. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering wh what you've seen work in terms of breaking down those kinds of those kinds of issues. Do you want to try, give it a try? Sure. Well, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think it goes back to incentives. Um, <laughs> and I, I think what you need to do, is, and I think this sort of builds on the, the conversation about get, you know, organizing people around a common outcome. You know, if you can align the incentives for individuals to, you know, to understand how what they're doing and their individual, uh, you know, mission and their their individual resources, how that fits into the whole. I think that that really works, and that sounds a little bit pie in the sky, but it there are very specific tactical things that you can do uh, to make that happen, and I think it's sort of a combination of a carrot and a stick. Um, you know, you give pe you reward people for behaving in a way that benefits you know, the big picture, the enterprise, um, and also maybe you know, my, my pet one is that you take away uh, things that might punish them for doing so, because I think historically those, that's been in place, and you might be talking about experiencing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let Ron. I still have my level here. I'll just piggyback on what uh, Laura said. One of the interesting things that, uh, that we did in the intelligence community, um, uh, Mike McConnell, when he was DNI, and we did this literally with about two hours of discussion. Uh, he instituted personal performance agreements with all the agency heads, but not on not with respect to their individual missions because they work for a cabinet secretary. That was fairly straightforward. Uh, their goals and objectives were shared, uh, and you can imagine the initial reaction, which was, "I'm not responsible for that. You can't hold me accountable <laughs> if I don't have all of the authority." Well, the problem is you share it. And after the initial misgivings, I had the chance to brief that to all of these federal agency heads, and I can tell you how warmly it was received. Uh, there's a lot of heat in the room. Uh, but, but it's been institutionalized, and, and the focus, again, is on these shared goals. And to Susan's point, once they realize that they can't do that alone, and they actually had to put it in writing to start, it became a very powerful uh, incentive for them to, to work together. Yeah, and I think uh, I think he's also you've also made the case for why enterprise leadership is so important because yes that those things do do occur um, it is a barrier to collaboration across government but yet it takes that kind of a leader that Ron talks about to be able to set the standards and expectations in order to try to say we're gonna we're not gonna go through this big huge reorganization that'll take multiple years and ultimately probably not achieve its objectives but we're actually just gonna work together in, in the structure we have and figure out a way to do this, and I think that that's, that's a much better solution. Jackson, you wanted to add to this conversation? Yes, I'm getting all excited over here. <laughs> uh, at, at Brookings Exec Ed, one of the things uh, we've learned, first of all, there are many ways to overcome these turf battles, but one way to overcome it, and you heard uh, Thad and other people echo the sentiment, is that if you collectively formulate the problem together, then it becomes your problem, and that then turns into the set of goals and, and values where instead, if you're jumping toward a solution because you have an agenda, that's where a lot of the turf battles and, and the conflicts occur. And so I would put a plug in for the notion of processes. There are a variety of processes. We, we teach some of them in our programs, but processes where you come together with a clean slate and collectively figure out what is the issue we're trying to solve. And when that happens, then it becomes everyone's ownership. And that's different from the way most people come to meetings. Often we come to meetings and within a few moments, the solution's already on the table and that leads to, to, to the fight. So I'm just throwing out this additional mechanism which uh, I thought I heard through a lot of the comments but I thought I'd uh, amplify. Great, and Jim, you, you, you said something that really resonated with me which is reorganization. <laughs> I mean, every president naively comes in and asks for reorganization authority. 
he doesn't get it. Uh, he puts a reorganization plan on the table. It doesn't happen. Um, there's lots and lots of reasons for that. And a lot of us have come to the conclusion that, yeah, in spite of the stories about, you know, how many agencies run, have rules about salmon, et cetera, that what really matters is this getting the government to work more, more horizontally. Um, because the reorganization in a mature and complex government just gets to be a little bit more trouble than it's ultimately worth. And nobody's ever sort of shown me a, a compelling uh, case for this with one exception, which is the merger of basically INS and Customs at the border, which I think, and again, that was quite painful for everyone involved, but I think that that was one of those few areas where they, they came up independently for historic reasons, but basically it never really did make any sense to have two different agencies and two different cabinet departments operating at the border. Did you want to add something, Susan? Oh, I, I did. Uh, Laura, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I, you know, I, I wanted to add to that really resonated with me too, and I, I think, um, you know, my background originally was in state and local government where you actually can reorganize a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. It's still horribly painful um, and difficult. But what, I, what I've seen from my experience is that even when you can reorganize, you just create new seams. So yeah. that need for enterprise <laughs> leadership is never going to go away. Right. Um, yeah, that's, so a really, that's a really good point. You replace an old set of seams with a new set of seams. So and five years down the road, you still find yourself with a need for enterprise leadership. Great. Uh, let's see. We've got room for two more questions. And we got two questioners back there and right here. And, I'll, and we might be able to get one more. Yes. I'm going to stand because I'm short. Um, I'm Chai Feldblum from Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I want to thank you very much. This is fantastic. Um, I do also agree with the point of incentive, incentive, incentive. So my question to all of you is about performance plans for SESers because I feel, at least at the EOC, that we really worked on getting a completely different type of strategic plan, try to change a culture, and I have found that in two years, the performance plans have still not been able to be changed to, in fact, and I think Jackson had this fantastically, you can't hold me responsible if I don't have full authority. Mm -hmm. Well, but if what needs to happen is you working with someone else in order to achieve the goal, then yes, I would like to hold you responsible. It's just I'd like to hold you and the other person also responsible. But I guess I, I um, obviously OPM is you know a key piece here, but really from all of you, um, actually I'll, one last thing I noticed uh, recently that in the regulations it says that SESers are supposed to um, provide input into the development of the performance plan. And I'm wondering if that happens well in any agency, because that to me seems essential. Uh, let me uh, take a quick uh -huh. stab at this. Ms. Feldblum, thank you for the question, first of all, and your leadership at EEOC. I spent 12 years at EEOC, so it's, uh, it's good to see you uh, tackle the wicked challenges, including budget, that, that the EEOC is facing. Um, I want to very quickly just put in a plug for an effort that I led a couple years ago. In, it was actually an enterprise leadership uh, effort itself as a microcosm in uh, basically leading an interagency effort to design a new SES performance appraisal system. And so we had uh, representatives of over 30 different federal agencies, offices of inspector generals, uh, small agencies, medium-sized agencies, large departments come together uh, and design within 10 weeks uh, a new SES performance appraisal system uh, applicable to all federal agencies uh, and, and uh, to be implemented across the entire federal government. I'm proud to, to report that by the end of October of this year, we will have over 90% of federal departments and agencies that will be using this new SES performance appraisal system. So the effort is a perfect example of the fact that enterprise leadership in coordination can and, and, and will work. Uh, but the new performance appraisal system is founded upon the five ECQs, leading change, leading people, uh, results-oriented, business acumen, and building coalitions. And it provides a foundation for all agencies to be, Im be able to embed the organizational and individual performance uh, expectations and requirements <laughs> focused specifically on enterprise leadership. Now, my good friend, uh, Dr. Sanders, Ron Sanders, who, t uh, who Susan tells me I should trust, um, uh, has, been trying to, <laughs> has been trying to get uh, me to, to focus 
after leading this incredible effort that now uh, over 80 different federal agencies and departments are using to, to tweak that and to add a six ECQ, which will be a monumental enterprise leadership activity in and of itself. Um, but whether it's a six ECQ focusing on enterprise leadership or using the current building coalitions, which neatly captures this whole concept of enterprise leadership, the foundation and the tools are there. Now it's up to the agencies to really uh, prioritize and to use this new tool to focus on enterprise leadership. Okay, I think we've got the last question back there. Yes. Yeah, the quick question I guess I had, and it kind of follows up with the idea of trust. Uh, I'm aging myself, but there was one time, and now maybe in some schools it's being taught again, good citizenship. And I guess what I'm talking about is basically character, ethics, and good citizenship. To me, those are qualities that are good leaders and certainly uh, enterprise leadership, which I think is a fascinating idea of working with one another. And I just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on those qualities, because obviously we've seen on the private side and in some instances in government where poor ethics, poor character, and obviously poor citizenship led to a lot of crises that we have. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that particular three or four points. Anybody want to take that on? Jim? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> it's one of the objectives of, of the program that I run, too, is to uh, instill that. I, I, I think that the vast, vast, vast majority of, uh, of government workers uh, have very, very high ethics, of course, and ought to be applauded for that, quite frankly. Uh, and I think that goes a long way in, in order to do that. In, 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 in my program, we actually focus on that because that's what it takes to kind of build that next generation of leaders as well that's going to come into the agency as, as uh, younger employees and uh, look, go into an organization that they uh, think that they have a difference in. I think, you know, there was a, I think the Merit System Protection Board does a survey every couple of years, and on one of their recent surveys, it says they asked a, a bunch of, uh, or all the federal employees, one of the questions they asked is, uh, you know, do you, you know, why do you do your job? I said, they're motivated to do their job because they think their job is important. 98%, you know, that kind of thing. And, I, and you know, I, I go, wow, that's a, that's a great thing. I know that there's the folks in the audience that say, well, we'll try to figure out what those 2% are doing and we'll correct that. You know, I said, you know, hey, <laughs> we got the 98 percent. Let's let's let, let's let's figure out ways to to further that. So yes, I, you know you can focus on those uh, you know 0.00001 percent of folks that that do make mistakes, and uh, the typical response from Congress uh, and quite frankly senior leadership is uh, you know let's punish all for the sins of the few. And uh, I think if you just focus more on the positive here, yeah, it may have a, a, a more of an impact. Great. Anybody want to add anything? Yes. I would like to. I think uh, I always give people a benefit of a doubt, and I think uh, people come at something with probably the best of intentions. Certainly, with my interagency work, I have I come away with a tremendous amount of respect uh, for all my colleagues and the issues that they deal in, deal with day in and day out. But I think we're all in this, I, and I, this is generalizable statement that we think we make a difference. But one of the things that we're not doing as leaders is saying, because we brought this interagency team together, these are the results that they had as a team that they could not have had as a single agency. We are not doing that. And I think when the younger folks, when the middle uh, folks, um, I can say that at my age, <laughs> that when they see that there are results and that they can make a difference by working together because they see the results when other people have worked together, they'll want to be part of that. They'll want to, they will gravitate towards working together. And we don't have to be so concerned about reorganization. We don't have to be so concerned about, we can document it in performance uh, plans, absolutely, shared outcomes, but it'll become, it will be more embraced because they see results and they can see the results that are happening right now across the federal government, we just don't know about it. And I think that's a gap that we all share, to highlight, to highlight the successes that are happening right now 
by interagencies working together and looking at problems more strategically. We've identified mm -hmm. a few here in this group, but I think there are a lot more, and we need and we need to highlight those build the incentives to, to, to go towards uh, Laura, to towards you get that. the last word on this. Oh, yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> and, and I don't want to end on a dark note, but I would be remiss, Government Accountability Office, if I didn't, <laughs> if I, if I didn't mention this. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of my caveats. I really do believe that the vast majority of people are in government, not for the money. I know I'm not here for the money, but because they really want to change the world. I know that sounds a little idealistic, but I think that's what, what most of us are here. And I totally agree. I think if you can really get people to have a vision around the, the outcomes, they, that's, that makes a huge difference. But, <laughs> and the few times that, that that doesn't work because people have lost their way or whatever, that performance agreement, the, the, the incentives, it, that's also a, an accountability tool. If you clearly de mm -hmm. define what people are responsible for accomplishing, um, I think there's less room for people to veer off the path. So, Great. Well said. Um, listen, thank you to our panel. For <laughs> and now, I want to call back the authors here, okay? Professor Jackson Nickerson. Ron, you're not coming up? I'm going to let Jackson know. Okay, Jackson, you get the last word. You join me in the thanking Elaine for her service today. I'd like to get you out of here in just a few minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to lend my voice of appreciation for all of you uh, being here, our speakers, and the people who contributed to the book. I'm sure you know it takes quite a while to, to uh, not only write the chapters, but we had great support from Booz Allen and Hamilton tracking down all the authors when uh, it was hard to get them sometimes to get things delivered on a deadline. So my appreciation and thanks go out to them. Uh, in case you're interested, uh, the book uh, you could have bought beforehand before you came here, it's available in the bookstore. It's also on Amazon.com, which tends to have a lower price. So if you want to download and read it, I want to give that plug for the book. I, I don't think we're going to make the New York Times bestseller list, but if we get close, that would be pretty exciting. Uh, a few other general announcements. Uh, Ron Sanders and I will be leading a, a new program called Building Networks and Partnerships Enterprise Leadership. And you probably found an announcement on your seat. And it's going to be based on some of the things we've uh, learned through the book. I hope you'll find that uh, useful and we'll consider it. I also want to mention that this book is part of a series. Uh, one of my goals here at Brookings Executive Education is to help to bring new innovations to, in leadership to government. And so this is the second book in the series, but we anticipate additional books. Often there's the flavor of the month or something has been recast that has existed before. And what we're trying to do is identify those innovations and in leadership that will make a difference, particularly for the government. So I ask you to remember the book series and, and at least consider it when new books uh, come out. Uh, with that, I'd like to close today. Thank you so much for, for being here. We appreciate your time, and we hope that you get some value out of it. Have a great day. Be safe. Thank you.